Globalization is making the rich world even richer, but billions are locked out. They're living on the edge between the rich world and the poor. They face tough choices if they want to join the party. Some say globalization's causing a clash of civilizations. Others call that fantasy. But it's not fantasy if you face a choice between prosperity and your faith. That's the choice faced by a young football fan when he and his friends found their future locked in a filing cabinet. This is a story of an island on the edge. Lamu is on the eastern coast of Kenya. It's an island that looks east and west, creating dilemmas for its people. The way they solve them may affect all of us. Lamu is poor. One ambulance, of a sort, one car. But can its people overcome poverty without compromising Islamic values? It's a dilemma that's not easily solved. You might think that it would be easy, just get a good education and the good jobs that come with it. 18-year-old Abdul Karim has been invited back to his old school to be congratulated on his exam results, the best this year. He's a strict Muslim and, in keeping with his religion, wants to help people by training as a doctor. His success should help him achieve that dream. Actually, I'm overwhelmed with happy. I'm very glad to hear that I got B+. But there's a problem. First of all, before everything, I want first to collect my certificate, which uh, I owe the school at around 10,000. Abdul Karim owes the equivalent of $160, a sizable amount for a poor Kenyan. And until he finds that money, he won't be given the certificate he's earned, and it's so crucial for his future. I have to first collect my certificate because you cannot go any any place in this Kenya first without any certi without certificate. So I have to find any means to to get my certificate. The school can't afford just to give the exam certificates away free. It has no dining tables or library, and subsidies promised by the government haven't yet arrived. It desperately needs the 32,000 US dollars it's lost because of unpaid school fees. So for decades it's been withholding certificates from pupils who can't afford to pay. There are some students who've passed through the school, some have passed well, but they have huge fee arrears of which uh, if we give them this certificate it means the money will not be paid. So we have to retain these certificates up to such a time that they clear with us and then we release these certificates to them. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, the number of certificates we have is so large, more than uh, almost 800 certificates. And this one here is 1975. 1975, the people start for the exam here in 1975 and they have not picked their certificates. Can you look at one? Each of these files could represent a wasted education or even a wasted life. So without this certificate, there's no way you can get employed or there's no way you can go to college because you do not have proof that you've gone through school. It is very tough 
But uh, it's tougher for the school because we have debt to clear. We have to pay for the food that they have taken. We have to pay for the electricity that we consume. We have to pay the workers. We have so many workers here. The cooks, the watchmen. These people have to be paid. And unless we get this money, there's no way we can uh, pay for that. The rest of the students bring the fees. Remember, we have still have some debts for last year. Some of you have not paid debts for last year. Leave alone for this year. We are not going to allow anybody who is going to have a fees balance. The best student of the year, Abdul Karim, is in danger of having his certificate locked away forever. He could start paying off his debts by working as a tour guide, but that's something he's not prepared to do. No, according to my faith, I will not work with any tourist. Some of them, uh, I, they, are, they, are, they are really bad. So to me, I don't think if I will work with them, I will have rather become a madrasa teacher to teach, to teach students. It's a pity. He's a good boy. He's one of the best boys in the school. In fact, he has been position one, I think, from form one up to form four. Abdul Karib is a wonderful student. And um, he has been having face problem, surely. And uh, up to now, I think he has to pay like around 8,000 Kenya shillings or 10,000 Kenya shillings. And um, in fact, he's worried. He's not sure if uh, he'll be able to get back his certificate to continue this university education or not. Abdul Karim isn't the only one of his footballing friends who can't afford the certificates. His close friend Abu Bakr owes 15,000 Kenyan shillings, almost $250. And a third friend, Arafat, who's still at school, already owes over 200. Arafat's a more laid-back character than his friends, something of a beach boy. But all three are devout Muslims. What they must now decide, how to pay off their debts without compromising their religion. Like much of Africa, Lamu is crazy about football. Most celebrate British clubs, a reminder on this remote coastal island how globalized the world has become. A few years back, graffiti lauding British footballer David Beckham competed with slogans for Osama bin Laden. There was even a local football team called Al-Qaeda. Now it's gone, along with the Al-Qaeda graffiti. Here at least, Beckham is on the winning side. Our three Islamic footballers condemn extremism, and Abdul Karim reckons there's no contradiction between Islam and success in the material world. One day I'll become a great, talented, and brilliant footballer, so as I can be taken to to the nation abroad, far away from Kenya. When I play football, then I'll earn a lot of money. Because there are many Muslims who earn a lot of money, and it depends the way you spend those money. If you spend it nice, for example, to help others, to help poor orphans to build orphanage or as a way to help students to get away from their fees balances, but to help salary, to build hospitals and such like things. So I admire to become one day maybe I went and become a great player. Being a star like David Beckham may be an impossible dream. But the Beckham lifestyle isn't totally out of reach. Lamu has become a haven for discerning tourists and a playground for globalization's new elite. For fashionable artists, princesses, racing drivers, Lamu is one of their best kept secrets. They're attracted by chic hotels, the beaches, and the wildlife. And tourism means the chance of an income. It's the major income earner for Lamu. 
you know, you've got the fishermen because they bring in the fish for everyone, the crabmen, the local beach boys who take guests out on fishing trips, snorkeling trips, sunset trips. You know, because everything, because being no roads, everything is by boat. Can you, can you, can you hold him? Uh, oh, I can. Put him down then. Put him down. There you go. Part of Lamu's charm is its ancient links with the Islamic world. The traditional music is Tarab. It's a style that became popular along the East African coast in the 19th century, when Lamu came under the control of the Sultan of Oman. Lamu is still an island that looks not just to the west, but to Arabia, which is one reason why tourists find it unique. In the 70s, it acquired the reputation of a hippie paradise, an African goa, or Kathmandu. But Lamu's success as exotic destination presents its people with a fundamental dilemma. While they've nothing against ordinary law-abiding tourists like these, they still feel many Westerners are hippies or Rastafarians. Look at wow. you, you look absolutely... That's, that's how you I've got green that's eyes. Wow. wow. Wow, you look beautiful, yeah. Ginny. Thanks. Fantastic. We're <laughs> wow. a ninja. We are ninja. It's actually very sexy. It's it is sexy. I might have to buy one. So many of Lamu's Muslims feel they have to choose between dealing with Westerners and obeying their religion. The local imam is also a baker, selling cakes to tourists. He believes the dilemma can be resolved if his fellow Muslims are clear what they want from the West. We want from Western their knowledge, but not their culture. The tourists they are not so bad, they are not bad for us. But we have to be stronger on our culture, so we influence them, not them to influence us. Many young people can see some of them with Rasta. Now we can see them with alcohol, bottles of alcohol on the streets. Also the other side, uh, drug abuse is growing very fast here. Many young people, they are, have, have been drug abuse. All type of drugs are possible here. Majority of Lamu people, they are under line of the poverty line. Majority. Um, this play a big role to make them without any uh, principles. They can do anything. So the three friends now have to make a choice. As good Muslims, should they deal with the rich Western hedonists or not? It's a dilemma that splits them apart. For Arafat, the laid-back sailor of Dows, making cash from tourists is no problem. I have to get money, that's God's plan. But I do have also have a plan. Working with Dows, manage with some tourists. I love to work with them. It's like an easy thing. He doesn't share the imam's concern about rastas and hippies. To be a Muslim doesn't mean that maybe I've got maybe I've got a rasta, maybe or maybe I've got something else. You know, to be a Muslim depends on your faith. How you can manage your faith? If you believe, you have to believe. Shafaun. Allah engali a nice water. Like in, in uh, winter time. <laughs> Arafat would like to have a Western girlfriend, as some of his friends do. You know, I can say if we never get some girlfriend from Europe, it's an advantage from me. That's it. It's 
an advantage. It was very, very, very unnormal for a girl to be a friend with a boy before marriage. Very, very unnormal. But now, according to the influence of media, films, tourism, it has to be very normal now. You can see many girls they talk openly. Somebody is my a boyfriend, somebody is my girlfriend. Hmm? And it is, uh, before it was very shame. So at the moment is westernization winning and is Islam losing? Losing, of course. For people now they cannot see any danger of this. They just see material and things like this. We, we have a responsibility, imams and religious leaders. We have a big re responsibility to bring awareness to our people. Hmm? They cannot see until we open their eyes and then they can see the future. Of the three friends, Abdul Karim sides most strongly with the imam. He doesn't believe the fundamental principles of faith can be managed. You know, we have been brought up from, by Islamic faith. And I think, according to Islamic point of view, it is against to work with tourists. Not to work with tourists uh, to earn money and such like things, but the way they behave those tourists. For example, the way they dress, the way they brought Western culture to our community, they have a lot of negative effect than positive. Some of the tourists brought drugs, which is very harmful to our, to our community here in Lamu. I strongly believe in my religion and I follow the rules of the religion. So Abdul Karim refuses to work with tourists, even though it could help him make the cash to buy his exam certificate and ensure his future as a doctor. Instead, this highly gifted young Muslim serves on a vegetable stall in Lamu's ancient market. Here he earns 50 Kenyan shillings, about 80 cents, a day. His friend Arafat reckons Abdul Karim's being guided by his own principles more than his religion. Yes, that's his own principle. Maybe he has got very limited faith. Maybe it's the way he managed to get some money is very, very little, little bit. But at the same time, maybe after he has got a lot of money, maybe he can change his faith. Abdul Karim works on the stand with his friend Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is 20. He wants to become a language teacher but he too must earn enough money to get hold of his certificate. Although siding more with Abdul Karim, he's doing so rather reluctantly. I like tourists, but my religion is not allowed to do that job. The three friends can't agree on how they should react to the tourists and their Western values. Their dilemma is a reflection of a wider debate in Lamu, and the stakes are ever higher. Foreigners are often so entranced when they set foot in Lamu and neighboring Manda Island, they end up buying property here. I think these big houses are sad, personally, because they come, they have their holiday home, and then it sits empty for 10 months of the year. They maybe use it two months of the year. Lamu is being transformed as outsiders buy up beachfront plots and beautiful old houses. When Westerners offer millions of Kenyan shillings to spend on property, their money's even harder to turn down. The value of the houses is, is very high. It's not that uh, people, they really want to sell their houses, but you are getting an offer that you can do something else and get out from where you are and be someone else. Most of the people now from Lamu are shifting in Mombasa because someone has his house maybe worth one million, and someone come and give you 15 million. 15 million, you go to Mombasa, you can get two, three houses. One, you stay by yourself. 
Two, you take a rent and you say hasta la vista. For example, for someone like me to have a house in the beach, I want to enjoy the beauty of the view, the beauty of the breeze, the beauty of the nature. But if I, I'm not wealthy enough, I cannot enjoy those kind of beauty. You know, so that's why most of the most of the beach properties are belong to the foreign. Abdul Karim's less relaxed about Westerners buying friends and neighbors' properties, and he says he's not alone. Most of the people think I'm very angry about them because maybe I have my relative, I have my neighbor. He wants a property or he wants a plot for such kind of money. For example, two million. And here comes a foreigner. He also wants a, a same plot of money for about 10 million. So he always goes to the, to the higher amount of money than two million. So most of the people here think about it. And this is the major challenge that's faced most people of Lamu. I think they must have something to do about it before it is too late. Like his friends, Abdul Karim strongly opposes Islamic extremism. And there's no evidence Al-Qaeda sympathizers are hiding here now. But one of the men behind the US embassy bombing in Nairobi is reported to have taught in the area. And Lamu is just 70 miles from lawless Somalia. So the US military has been trying to win hearts and minds with help for local students, including at one time Abdul Karim. With most people grateful for the help, the Imam says the biggest danger now is Western paranoia. I can tell them to be away from phobia. The problem of them is Islamic Islam phobia. We are not like that. They make very from very, very little seed a very big uh, tree. They are fear for nothing. We cannot cause a danger for anyone. Lamu is on the edge between spiritual Islam and the consumer West. In a globalized world, the two are bound to meet and maybe clash ever more often. As the West moves in, the future of the long established Islamic community here is in the balance. Young Muslims who live on this idyllic island have to decide how to react. Yeah, that is the problem. That is the major problem that faces most of them. Because they don't know whether may I go for maybe to sell tomatoes or maybe to have any other kind of work or maybe may I go to the tour guide. But most of them think about the money. So they think that this tour guide earns a lot of money. Some of them are engaged in that dilemma whether to do this or to do that, that thing. But one thing I've told them is about you have faith, have faith in God, trust God. Do not engage yourself into activities which will come to regret after that. As we leave them, Abdul Karim and his friends still face their dilemma. How to make money to claim the exam certificates they need without compromising their Muslim values. Until they solve this dilemma, their future remains locked away. Love boys, love boys, love boys.